Pastor Aaron's, we love you. <laughs> Lady Aaron, thank you so much for that warm welcome. We were blown away. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Jesus. Amen. Four years I traveled a road all wrong. My heart had lost its joy and its song. Then grace placed me right where I
good and our gracious God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. St. Matthew chapter 12. St. Matthew 12, reading from verse 38 through to verse 40. St. Matthew 12, verses 38 through 40. It reads like this, reading from the New King James Version. You may, you may remain seated. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered, saying, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. I want to speak to us today on this thought, your worst mess may become God's best message. Your worst mess may become God's best message. I'll put a disclaimer out there before we get into this because I do not want anyone to leave here with the idea that this topic, this message, is an endorsement of making a mess, of messing around. But rather, it is an acknowledgement that making a mess is something that is common to all humanity. Every one of us in here, if you are over a certain age, <laughs> you know what it is to make a mess. You know what it is to mess up. And so this message is simply endorsing that idea that God may redeem the mess and turn it to a message. And note the word may, because not every mess is going to become a message. And may suggest that there is a contingency factor. God will not use your mess as a message while you're still in it. But if we repent, can somebody say repent? Hallelujah. Recently I was asked as we are preparing for the FOJ Summit to write an autobiographical summary of my life, the height points of my life to this point for the magazine that we're preparing. So I submitted a three-page summary highlighting what I consider to be the most positive details and accomplishments of my life to this point. But as I reflected on the summary that I submitted to the FOJ committee, it began to dawn on me that I presented myself as though I was an unqualified success. I, I, I presented my, my educational achievements, but not once did I put in there the times that I struggled, Whoa. the times that I failed the courses. I, I didn't put the time when I, I got an F on a course. I, I didn't put that. I, I didn't put the time when for semesters I had to withdraw from school because I, I just didn't have the, the mental energy to finish. I, I didn't I didn't write that in there. I, 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 I wrote about my 10 years as a Bible quizzer back in Jamaica and how many trophies we won, but I didn't tell them how many times in that 10 years we didn't win any trophies. I, I, didn't, I didn't put those things. I, I described my journey in ministry and in my growth in the faith, but not one time, and I talked about all the levels of licensing that I have received as a minister, but I did not write in that summary that at some point on the journey I had sinned. I, had, I, I didn't write that I fell down at any point on the journey of faith. And I believe that I am not the only one who likes to present the best version of myself for the world to see. I believe I have some witnesses in this house right now. That if you were asked to write your life story, you will write about the times when your prayer life was on fleet. You will write about the time when your self-control, when you had it together, when you resisted the temptation. You will write
write about the times you overcame, but most of the times we will not write about the failures that we made. Whoa. We will not write. Matter of fact, we won't even testify right sometimes in church. Come on now. One of the things I do not miss about, who remember the testimony services on a Sunday morning when, when we would ask those on the right for the testimony to stand and folks would stand and begin to testify. And, and sometimes, Pastor Aaron, the way that the testimonies would go would be something like, I'm glad I chose Jesus. I'm glad that I was so good that I chose Jesus. We, we testify in a way that makes it seem that we had it all together. That's a fact. That's a fact. And, and I go even further because a lot of us in here are on social media. And, and when you get ready to post on social media, you, you, you look for that picture where you were wearing the dress that fit you just right or the suit that just fit you right. You, you, you look for the picture further that got your right side at the right angle, the right perspective, and the lighting was just right to camouflage that big pimple on your cheek. You, you look for those things so you can present an almost flawless image of yourself to the world. Yeah. Brothers and sisters, but that's innate to human nature. We want to present the best side of our world for the consumption of the public. And that is why I, 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 I have some questions about the book of Jonah that is in the Bible. Because knowing this fact that all of us have this innate desire to present the best version of ourselves... I ask the question, why in the world would Jonah record events about his life that presents him in such a negative light to this world? When, when I read the story of the prophet, anybody ever read the book of Jonah in the, over there in the Old Testament? And, and, and that's not a positive image of Jonah at all. Matter of fact, if I should begin to ask us in this congregation, what do you think about Jonah? I would hear such adjectives as he's disobedient, he is rebellious, he ran away from God, his one prophetic utterance did not even come true because he said in 40 days Nineveh will be destroyed and Nineveh did not get destroyed. Why? Why? Why did Jonah present this negative review of himself? If, if that was the only record of Jonah that I knew, I would think Jonah was a complete failure. That's a fact, sir. Well, brothers and sisters, when I go over in the book of 2 Kings, chapter 14 and verse 25, I begin to realize that Jonah had a successful prophetic career alongside Elisha and Amos and Hosea. In fact, under the reign of King Jeroboam II, it was the ministry and the prophecy of Jonah that enabled them to win victories and battles and to secure the borders of Israel. Jonah had a positive and a successful prophetic career. Yet when God asked Jonah to write something, when God inspired Jonah to write a book that would be preserved for centuries, because now we far removed from Jonah's reality are now reading about him. Yes, Jonah did not write the best events of his life. He wrote about the worst failure Amen. of his life. Mighty God. Why? Why would, why would he write that one negative event that occurred in the twilight years of his life when there were many other glowing events he could have written about. Mighty God. But I gotta go further because we understand that what these writers wrote in the scriptures was not just their own will, but they wrote by the inspiration of God. That is to say, God was dictating to them what they needed to write in the Bible. So We've got to now ask God, therefore, what is your purpose for allowing Jonah, for inspiring Jonah to write what I would consider to be the worst failure in the life of Jonah? Why, why did you ask him to write about this one time when he rebelled against you and, and failed to comply with your instructions to go down to Nineveh? Oh my God. 
And brothers and sisters, I believe God would respond like this, that God is trying to preserve a record in the Bible that the mercy of God is what enables imperfect people like Jonah and David and Saul, all of these people who've got great messes in their lives, God will preserve a record that the people in the Bible are not perfect people. They were flawed people. They had their skeletons in the closet. They made their mistake, but God allowed these to be written so that imperfect people in this house yes, can find identity and hope. That's why I read the Bible because I understand that they were not perfect. They were flesh and blood people. They had like passions like we have. They had some of the same desires and drives that you and I had, but they are trophies of God's mercy. God is able to show mercy to imperfect people. And you and I here ought to begin to rejoice right now yeah. because you and I know that we are not perfect. As a matter of fact, sometimes, sometimes, I, I won't lie to you, sometimes when I listened to testimonies in the church when I was much younger, there were times when I thought, my goodness, can I ever make it? Can, 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 can I? Can I? Because when I hear all the testimonies of the perfections of the people of God, and I knew what I was struggling with in my teenage years, I thought to myself, maybe church is not for me after all. Come, come here, come, come here, come here, saint. I want us to understand that we do not well when we only present the positive side of ourselves. We ought to let people know such were some of us. We were whoremongers too. We told some lies too. We did some clubbing too. Yeah, we, 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 didn't, we didn't come out of our mother's womb sprouting wings. We, we had some issues too. We made some messes too, but we are washed. But we are sanctified. But we are justified by the Spirit of God, and that is what has made the difference in our lives. Such are some of us. The world of imperfect people is looking for some real people who themselves are imperfect, but who are being perfected by the perfect God. Am I talking to anybody here? That's what the world needs. The world does not need fake phonies who pretend like they've got no struggle or they've never been through anything. So, in the book of Matthew 12, 38 to 40, I'm a teacher, so I'm going I'm to talk to us as, a, as the word of God. Anybody getting this? Is this making sense to anybody else? In, in Matthew 12, verses 38 to 40, Jesus is in this conversation with the Pharisees. And the Pharisees are looking at this lonely Jesus who, in, in, in his teaching in Matthew 12, he is announcing himself as the Lord of the Sabbath. He is announcing himself as the shepherd of Israel. He is discerning thoughts. He is talking about the forgiveness of sins. And, and so these are all the things that the Messiah could do. But, but they're looking at this little Jesus in there, and this, this little carpenter from poor Nazareth of Galilee, and they are saying to themselves, man, he's doing all the things that only the Messiah should do, but this man can't be the Messiah because there's not too much to him. There, there is not too much to him, and we've got the tendency to too to sometimes look down on people that there is not too much to them, but you don't know what plans God has for the peaceful person that is sitting beside you right now. Whoa. Looking down at him. And so they said to him when they couldn't abide attention no more, they, they asked him, can you give us a sign? Give us a sign that you are the Messiah. Brothers and sisters, let me say this to us. We've got to be careful how we run after signs in the church. The Bible says that in the church, signs shall follow the people of God. But I'm afraid that we now have created this modern day church that is running after signs. Every Johnny come late, the prophet, we were running after them because we are so enamored and fixated on signs. And Jesus said, man, I've given you guys so many signs. Oh, and, oh. and if you, if your heart cannot believe the word of God, no sign 
at all is going to make you believe. So I'm done with giving you signs, he says. The only sign I'm going to give you now is the sign of the prophet Jonah. Now, when he talked about the sign of the prophet Jonah, he's talking about this idea of resurrection because everybody knew that Jonah, three days in the belly of a whale, really should have died. And so his account was really one of resurrection. Jesus said, the only sign I'm going to give you that I am the Messiah is the sign of resurrection. You've got to understand this here. Resurrection is the best message that Jesus can preach. It is the best message to a human race that is bound by the chains and the promise of death because it's appointed unto every one of us once to die. So the worst enemy you and I have is the enemy of death, and that is the last enemy that we are going to overcome. All of us live our lives under the fear of death, the impending of death. Matter of fact, a lot of folks will deny Christ when their lives are threatened. Am I talking to anybody in this house? Am I, am I in the right house? But there are some folks who will deny the faith if they know that their life is at risk. But I believe that we're in a time now. We've got to make our minds up that for God I live or for God I die. And that is become truer more than we want to think. Because with the agenda that to be pushing our world right now that are anti-Christ and anti-church. We've got to understand that it's only a matter of time before persecution comes our way. Death, the greatest enemy. And therefore, the best message that Jesus can present to the world is the message of resurrection. And, and to, to, to validate the possibility of resurrection, he does not pull for the record of Isaiah, the courtly prophet. He doesn't pull for the record of Daniel, the righteous man in the city of Babylon. No, he pulled for the worst failure among the prophets. He pulled for the story of Jonah. What a God we serve. Brothers and sisters, I want to tell you this in the house right now. Now, that when God is getting ready to give a witness to the world, he might not be pulling for those we think he's going to pull for. He might be pulling for those who the world has written off because the mistakes you have made, the missteps you have made. But he is saying, if I can take you and the mess you made and forgive you and wash you, I can use the worst mess to preach my best message to the world. Jonah's worst mess could become the best message of Jesus. Let's, 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 let's talk about this mess that Jonah made. And I want to I wanna highlight for us three things that I see in the story of Jonah. First of all, the story of Jonah is a good message about the problem of rebellion. Everybody said the problem of rebellion. Come on, church, talk back to me. I believe in talking back. The, 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 the best message that Jonah is preaching here out of his mess is about the problem of rebellion. Everybody said the problem, the problem of rebellion. rebellion. Let's say one more time. Rebellion, rebellion. is a problem. It's a problem. Yeah, poke that neighbor beside you who's falling asleep and tell them rebellion, rebellion. is a problem. It's a problem. Rebellion is the problem. Jonah chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise and go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for the wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa, found a ship going to Tarshish, paid the fare, and went down into the ship. Jonah decided that he was going to go the opposite way. But where God wanted him to go. Brothers and sisters, rebellion is a problem for the human family. Yes, sir. Even, even the prophet of God is prone to rebellion. Even the pastors can sometimes receive an instruction from God that seems so impossible that we don't even like it and we can disobey God too. Jonah, the prophet of God, found himself in a place. Of rebellion. Why? Because God called him to a difficult assignment. God told him to go to Nineveh. Now, Nineveh might sound simple enough. Why wouldn't the prophet want to go to Nineveh? Why wouldn't you want to go to proclaim the word of God? Just go, Jonah. You preach all your life. You know what to say. You know how to say it. And if you've got the organ behind you, you can say it and make people sing all the chandeliers. Go preach the word of God in Nineveh, Jonah. 
But, but brothers and sisters, we, we've got to we've got to understand why Jonah responded the way he did. You see, Nineveh was the enemy of Israel. Nineveh was the capital city of Assyria. Assyria is the enemy of Israel. And in fact, about 50 years after Jonah died, Nineveh, Assyria, took Israel captive. So Jonah would have a natural and a social right to not like Nineveh. You gotta hear me in the South. Brothers and sisters, Jonah decided that this task is too great for me because this goes against my personal desires. I want Nineveh to be destroyed. I, I want Nineveh to feel the wrath of God. Nineveh does not deserve the mercy of God. But you and I got to understand this, that you and I do not get to decide who deserves God's mercy or not. Everybody deserves the mercy of God. Matter of fact, none of us deserve the mercy of God. Because if it is mercy, nobody deserves God's mercy. Jonah decided that Nineveh was not worth the time to go preach the gospel to them. And brothers and sisters, you and I might that that might not be our problem, but I I believe that right in this house that that every one of us in here that there is something within you, some passion, some desire, some preference that when God's word comes to you and challenges that preference and challenges that desire it can push you to the point where you too rebel against God. Am I talking to anybody here? Yeah. The time God told you that relationship was not. But give me a little more of the monitors, please. I feel like preaching today. That the time when God told you that that relationship was not for you, but you ignored God's word and you went ahead anyway because he was just too cute and she was just, I'm not talking to anybody here. She was just too fine. The time when you knew that that money was not yours, but you took the money anyway because it, 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 it coincided with a desire that you had. Here's the deal. The possibility and the potential for rebellion is in every one of us. And I know that I may not have talked, I may not have touched on your personal issue, but everybody in here, you've got some area of passion and desire that God's word cuts against and it makes you struggle to obey God because rebellion is something all of us have to wrestle with. The problem, the problem of rebellion. But, but let me go further and press this matter of the problem of rebellion even further. You see, the first layer of the problem of rebellion is that all of us struggle with the desire to rebel. But the other side of the problem is that if we do rebel, there are consequences that come with rebellion. Here are the consequences for Jonah. Jonah, brothers and sisters, firstly, he made the wrong choice. He decided to run away from God. How do you hide from God when God sees everything that you do? If I make my bed in hell, he is there with me. If I take the wings of the morning, there is nowhere that you and I can go that God can't see you. He can see you in the dorm room the same way he sees you in your parents' house. He can see you at the frat party the same way he sees you in church. There is no place that we can go to hide from the presence of God. God's presence is everywhere. What are you doing, Jonah? He's trying to run from the presence of God. He's trying to go the opposite direction of where God is trying to get Jonah to go to. He's making the wrong choice. But and when you make the wrong choice, you also go down the wrong course. You'll notice, notice that in the latter part of verse 3 of chapter 1 of Jonah, Jonah 1 verse 3 and verse 5, you'll notice that every move that Jonah made was a move that took him downward. He went down to the ship, the shore, and found a ship that was going to Joppa. And he went down into the ship, and he went down into the side of the ship. And by the time we check, Jonah is fast asleep. Come here, brothers and sisters. I want you to understand this: that every time we step out of line with what God has for us, the only way we can go is to go down. We go down in our consecration. We go down in our thinking. We go down in our imagination. We go down in our morality. We are just going down. And the only way to set the downward spiral is to make a decision that I will make a turnaround. Jonah. 
Jonah kept on going down. Here's the deal. So he made the wrong choice, wrong course. But next we see Jonah in the wrong company. Notice in verses 5 to 9, this Jewish prophet had no business among pagans. But this is where we see Jonah going. He is hanging out with pagans who are offering sacrifices to idol gods. But because he made the wrong choice, wrong course, wrong company, now he finds himself in the wrong condition where now there is a storm facing Jonah oh, in the sea. Oh, no. Can I say this here? A lot of the storms that we have gotten ourselves into, let's not blame the devil. I know the devil is a bad fellow. Oh, but a lot of the storms oh. that we find ourselves in in our lives, oh. they are part of the consequences for our own action. Oh. Wrong conditions, but now it goes, it gets even worse, y'all. Jonah now begins to make the wrong confession. They asked him, Who are you? And he began to tell them, Well, I'm a prophet of the Lord. And 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 you would think that 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 him knowing, he says, the, the, the storm that we're all experiencing is because of me. And and, and and I would think that this is where Jonah would now say to God, I am sorry, Lord, I repent. But you know what Jonah did? No. Jonah said, take me up and throw me in the sea. Now, you and I may look at that and say, man, Jonah was a man of faith. He believed that God was going to deliver him. That was not the case. Jonah's request was prompted more by a stubborn rebellion that says, I would rather die than repent. I would rather, I know this relationship is bringing me down, but I'd rather go down with this relationship than come out of it and get myself right. I know this drug addiction is going in the wrong way, but I'd rather die than turn around. Am I talking to anybody here? Wrong, wrong, wrong confession. Brothers and sisters, oh, don't God. Look up going further down, down into the sea, down into the belly of a whale that swallowed Jonah, and he just continued going down until he was in the intestines of the whale. Yes. Oh, brothers and sisters, Jonah's testimony shares to us that rebellion is a problem for all of us. But let me go further. I see in this that Jonah's life also testifies of the pivot of repentance. Everybody say pivot. Pivot. Everybody say pivot. Pivot. The pivot of repentance. Everybody say the pivot of repentance. Pivot of repentance. You know what a pivot is? Yes, sir. What's a pivot? That thing that makes you stop and turn around. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Can I say this to everybody in here? The story of Jonah testifies to us that rebellion is a problem for all of us. But it also says that we don't have to die down the road of rebellion. There is the possibility to turn around and find our way back to God. Oh God, there is that possibility. The people that repent. Here it is. We're now in Jonah 2, verse 1 to 2. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the fish's belly. And he said, I cry out to the Lord because of my affliction. And he answered me, out of the belly of hell I cried, and you heard my voice. I'm glad that Jonah had the good sense that when he realized the direction that his life was going, the downward spiral, that he was in a place where were it not for the mercy and the intervention of God, he would not make it alive. I'm glad he had the good sense to decide it's time for me to cry out to God. It is time for me to cry out to God. I, I like this, brothers and sisters, because I believe that we, we have, in the, in the modern day church, we, we have lost that impetus to cry out to God. I, I remember times when we took sin so seriously and we still believe that there was a hell to avoid and a heaven to gain. When, when we begin to feel the pinch, of the consequence of our sin, we begin to open our mouths and to begin to cry out to God. God help us when we begin to feel comfortable living in the wrong way. My God, God help us. God help us when when we become so desensitized. 
ties to the presence and the spirit of God that we can no longer feel conviction. Whenever we get to that place where we can no longer feel conviction, not even the pastor can have them. I'm not talking to anybody in here, but is there anybody in this house right now who still knows how to cry out to God? Hear my cry, O God, and attend unto my prayer. From the ends of the earth will I cry unto thee. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. When I've had too much and I can't bear anymore, when I'm on the brink of depression, when I'm on the brink of struggling, when I'm on the place of suicide, hear my cry, O God, and attend unto my prayer. I think we need a church that knows how to cry out to God again. And then here's the deal, here's the deal, brothers and sisters. This, this, this is not just a message for the, the, the grown folks in the church. This is a message for everybody in here. Because I got saved at 11 years old. And what has kept me to this place is that I had the good sense to know when to cry out to God. I'm not talking to anybody here. There, there were seasons in my life when I couldn't figure things out. I couldn't reason things out. I couldn't work it out. But I just throw my hands up and say, Father, I stretch my hands to thee. In you I trust and I believe. I'm waiting on you, God. And by faith I shall stand. My healing, my deliverance, my coming out, my miracle is in your hand. I wish I could get somebody just to raise your hands right now and lift your voice to God right now. I said, Father, I'm crying out to you. I have no other help. This thing is so heavy for me. If you don't break these chains, this relationship is going to kill me. This addiction is going to pull me down. This way of life is about to make me go to hell. I'm not talking to anybody here. Cry out to your God. I am coming. Good God, hear me, Holy Ghost. Brothers and sisters, you gotta hear me. Can I talk to us here? Can you hear me, brothers and sisters? I know, I know that in our day, in our time, we've we've swallowed the lie that says praise is the way that the battle is won. No, praise is the way the victory is celebrated. But it is crying out to God. It is in those times of prayer. We, when we share the story of Jehoshaphat and how, how the Lord told him to arrange the armies and let them sing praise unto God, we are looking at the end of the story. What we sometimes neglect is that Jehoshaphat, that he first of all prayed to God and called for the reading of the Bible. I'm not talking to anybody here. We need prayer. We need to cry out to God. The church of the living God needs to get back to the place where we can cry out to where oh, Jonah cried out. Jonah says to me that if I will let my pride go and cry out to God, God can turn some things around. If you are in a mess right now, come on, don't be afraid. This is what church is about. Church is not about perfect people. Church is about people who are imperfect, who have come for an encounter with a perfecting God. I'm not talking to anybody here. This is where we cry out to God. It is still all right to cry out to God and let God know that my burdens are too heavy to bear. Help me, Lord. Jonah prayed, he cried out about his predicament. He says, Lord, the floods have surrounded me. Oh my God, we don't hear these kind of honest prayers regularly. We, we pray those curated prayers, those cute prayers, you know, those panicate prayers. No, when we get to God to pray, this is a moment to open up your heart and tell God what's really going on. He says, God, you cast me in the deep, in the heart of the sea. The floods surround me. The billows pass over me. I'm cast out of your sight. Uh, the weeds, the waters surround me. The deep close over me. The weeds are wrapped around my head. I'm down at the lowest part, at the base of the mountain, and except you come through for me. I can't get out of this. He cried out to God. He cried out. 
about his predicament. Cried out to God and quit playing around. He cried out with penitence. He said, my soul fainted within me. That is to say, I have now come to the end of myself. I realize that I can't help myself get out of this and nobody can help me get out of this but God because you've got to realize that when some storms are in your life, I don't care how many prayer lines you join, I don't care how many people smother you with oil, until you yourself begin to cry out to God, there will be no change or turn around. Don't let anybody fool you. You've got to cry out to God for yourself. Give me, give, me, give, me, give me a few minutes here, my God. I feel the Holy Ghost me here. We, we've got this new thing creeping into the church. We've got this new ideology creeping in the church where I hear ministers standing in the pulpit and looking at people and telling them, I cover you under the blood of Jesus. No, 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 no. I can't cover you under the blood of Jesus. You've got to appeal to the blood of Jesus for yourself. I'm not talking to anybody in this house. No, I can't forgive your sins. I can't repent for you. You've got to repent for yourself. Brothers and sisters, when the preacher is not around, then friends and loved ones take the fire. Don't depend on anybody else. You gotta go to Jesus for yourself. Because I know if you go to him, he will answer your prayer. Oh God, thank you, Jesus. Jonah prayed when he came to the end of himself. But notice, thank you, Bishop. He prayed, he prayed with promises to God. Verses 8 and 9 of chapter 2, Jonah 2, 8 and 9. He says, those who regard worthless idols, they forsake their mercy. Well, here's the deal. But I will sacrifice to you with a voice of thanksgiving. I will pay what I have vowed because salvation is of the Lord. What Jonah is saying is, God, I'm not praying for forgiveness so I can just go back to living life the same way. I'm going to ask you to heal me so that I can go back to doing what I like doing. I am not trying to be a consumer of your blessings without being committed to the cause. I'm not talking to anybody here. He says, if you bring me out, I will worship you in your temple. If you bring me out, I will offer the sacrifice of praise and joy to you. If you bring me out, I will withdraw my resignation. If you bring me out, I'll go back on the choir. I might talk to anybody here. If you bring me out, I'll find myself back in Sunday school. If you bring me out, I'll find myself back on the youth committee. If you bring me out, I'll find myself back in church. If you bring me out, I might talk to anybody here. What promise will you make to God? What commitment will you make to God? Don't want to say to God, if you bring I'll make sure that I do what your word says do. I feel the Holy Ghost in here. I believe that there ought to be somebody in this house who will say to God that if you bring me out this time, I refuse to go back like I did the last time. If you bring me out this time, I'll get my life together by the grace of God. Do you have anybody in here that if God brings you out this time, you are never going back? Because when Jonah repented, the Bible says in verse 10 of chapter 2 that God spoke to the fish. God spoke to the whale. The voice of God arrested the whale. Jonah didn't hear the voice of God, but God's voice spoke the whale. He says, you've held my son long enough. He has learned his lesson now. It's time for you to let him go, to let him out of here. Let me tell you, brothers and sisters, repentance is to the pivot today in this house. I don't care what road you're going down today. Whatever struggles you came in here with right now. Whatever chains seem to bind you. Whatever frustrations are playing out in your life. But right now, if you can repent your sins, if you can say, Father, forgive me, for I have sinned against heaven and against God. God can speak to your circumstances. They can turn around. Is there anybody in the house and testify that I was on my way down, but God turned me around. Is there anybody here who can testify that I thought that 
that I've never made it. But God, touch me and turn me around. If that's your shot, glory. Jonah is the worst mess became a message about the problem of rebellion. His worst mess became a message about the pivot of repentance. But can I close when I tell you that his worst mess became a message about the power of resurrection. Can I preach to somebody in here? Can I tell you that the best message that the world can have right now is a message of resurrection. Somebody holler resurrection. And the Bible says the Lord spoke the fish, and the fish vomited Jonah out on dry ground. Oh my God. You see, when you cry out to God, God can turn the trajectory of your life around. Because up until now, Jonah was going down. He had gone down to Joppa. He had gone down into a ship. He had gone down into the base of the ship. He had gone down into unconsciousness. He had gone down into the water. Down to the bottom of the mountains. Down in the bend of the whale. Down the esophagus of the whale. Down, down, down the mechanical summit of the whale. Down the pyloric summit of the whale. Down the chemical summit of the whale. Down the intestine of the whale. But my God, when he repented, the Bible says that God turned things around. That means that Jonah that was once on the way down, he came back. He came back up from the basement of the mountains. He came back. He came back above the dark layers of the water. He came back. He came back to the surface of the water. I said he came back to the intestines of the whale. He came back to the pyloric stomach of the whale. He came back to the chemical stomach of the whale. He came back to the mechanical stomach of the whale. He came back to the stomach of the whale. He came back. I wonder if there's anybody in this house right now. Do I have any comeback? That's the bonus in this house. You ought to give somebody a high five and say, I came back. I was once on my way down.
God's best message. Don't sit down with your testimony. You ought to tell somebody because the world is waiting to hear that you can go as far as your mistakes can carry you. But if you repent, God can turn them around. I feel the Holy Ghost in here. I feel the Holy Ghost in here. You want to tell somebody right now? I'm a witness. Come on, tell them. Tell them I'm a witness. I've got to close it here. But I want to challenge every child of God in this house. Share your testimony. You may not have a testimony service, but there is somebody on your job that is dying of depression. Depression killing them on the job. Oh God. But you ought to tell them your testimony that I was depressed too. But God, but God, but God, but God, but God, but God. But God. Hear me say to the house, there might be some young person that is struggling with a sin issue in the house, and rather than condemn them, we ought to tell them, I struggle too. But God, but God, but God, your worst mess can be God's best. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! We're all preachers in this house. You, your life to this point can preach a great message about the mercy of God and how God's mercy is able to rewrite the course of your life. I should have fallen. My soul. My soul cast down. But mercy. Oh, mercy. Oh, mercy. 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 Mercy made me get up. Mercy made me turn around. Mercy put the Holy Ghost in me. Mercy made me walk right. Mercy makes me talk right. Mercy gives me the strength to live right. And God's mercy can do it for you. Let's all stand in the house today. I believe there might be somebody in this house, right? There might be somebody in this house right now. Going through your own battles. Going through your own struggles. Just like Jonah. Not sure how to come out of it. But I am here to tell you today. That if you will find that pivot. Of repentance at this altar today. The same resurrection power. That spoke to Jonah's predicament. And tell him. You've got to spit him out. That same resurrection power in the Holy Ghost is in this church right now. Amen. In the Holy Ghost. Amen. And God can speak to and will speak to everything that holds you hostage. And tell that thing to let you go. So that just like Jonah was given another chance to preach to Nineveh, that you can declare God's word to the world. And it's asking for a sign. And God is saying, the only sign I will give you is the sign of so-and-so. Put your name in the blank. God is saying, somebody on your job, somebody in your neighborhood is asking God, give me a sign, God, that you can save. And God is saying, the only sign I'm going to give you is your next door neighbor. Look at how I've resurrected his life. Look at how I've turned her around. Look, look, look. God wants to use you as the greatest sign of resurrection power in this world. I want to open this song with somebody, right? Yeah. Somebody who wants to come to God. Hallelujah. say, God, I've gone too far. Uh, I've I, uh, too far trying to do life on my own terms. Whoa. I've gone way down too far. I am, I am tangled up in situations I did not believe I'd ever be in. Here I am, God. Contemplating joining a gang? No, 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 God. That's too far. That's too far. I want to put my life in your hands. I want to put my life in your hands. What? Here I am, thinking about selling drugs, using drugs, smoking, drinking alcohol. No, 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 no. That's too far. I never thought I'd 
go that far, God. But I want to turn around today. If that is you, I want to open this altar to you right now. There is mercy. Mercy. There was great. And we're going to for a little while, but we're going to say mercy. There was great. And grace was free. But I, 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 I still believe that there is somebody else in this house. God wants to save you. Clean you up. You may be going to hell. But God can pull you out of that. And have you to preach about the power of heaven. You may be low down and dirty and disgusted. But he can lift you up. And use you to teach about the power of the cross to pull people out of whatever mess they're in. If you have not yet been baptized in the name of Jesus, if you are not yet filled with the Holy Spirit, I want to invite you to sing. The Lord wants to save you. If we can have some saints, this is normal. You see, when you come, saints, it might make 